Thanks, Marta, for the wonderful introduction, the very thoughtful summary of the research body of knowledge to date. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be able to speak with all of you today. And I'm going to talk about how we can use big data to create change and improve upward mobility in our local communities at a very granular level, going down to specific blocks in New York City. But I want to start at a much bigger picture level by talking about the American dream in a national and historical perspective. So I'll start with this chart here, which considers a canonical notion of the American dream, the idea that through hard work, any child in America should have the chance of moving up relative to their parents. So what we're doing in this first analysis is asking the extent to which that's true in the United States, both today and in the past. What we're computing is a very simple statistic, which Sheldon referenced in his introduction, what fraction of kids go on to earn more than their parents did, measuring both the kids' and parents' incomes in their mid-30s and adjusting for inflation. And we're looking at that statistic by the year in which the child was born. So what you can see is that for children born in the 1940s and 1950s, it was a virtual guarantee that you were going to achieve the American dream of moving up. That is, 92% of kids born in 1940 in America went on to earn more than their parents did. If you look at what has happened over time, however, you see a dramatic fading of the American dream, such that for children born in the 1980s who are turning 30 today, it's only a 50-50 shot whether you're going to achieve the American dream, basically a coin flip, whether you're going to do better than your parents. So motivated by that trend, which I think is in some sense what brings all of us to the table here, it's what underlies, in my view, a lot of the frustration that people around the nation are expressing. In our research group at Harvard, Opportunity Insights, we are basically you know, trying to answer the question that many of you are also trying to pursue. How can we restore the American dream? How can we increase mobility out of poverty? And so our approach is characterized by three main features, which I'll illustrate in the talk today. The first is that we use big data to study how to increase upward mobility. So much as you hear a lot about how companies like Amazon and Google are improving the products they offer by taking advantage of very large data sets, analogously, our vision is that such data can be used to improve social and economic policy. Second, you'll see that we analyze a broad range of interventions from childhood to adulthood. We don't focus on any one specific thing, like trying to improve the quality of schools or trying to you know, focus on housing policy. Because as you'll see from the data, it really seems like the origins of these issues are very multifaceted. And so you want to think about a broad spectrum of issues, a sp broad spectrum of solutions together. Third, uh, as Marta anticipated in her introduction, the starting point for a lot of our work is to overlay that mobility perspective, looking over time, on a geographic perspective, looking at local differences in rates of upward mobility, both as a way to learn about what the drivers of upward mobility are and as a way to motivate potential local place-focused policy solutions. So let me dive into the data by starting with this map here, which I will describe briefly because I suspect many of you in the audience have seen this in the past or in the media and so forth. So what this map shows you is the geography of upward mobility in the United States. The way we construct it is by using data on 20 million kids born in the early 1980s in the United States. We link them to their parents uh, using anonymized tax and census data. Uh, and we basically compute the average income at age 35 for kids who grew up in low-income families, that is families earning about $25,000 a year, families at the 25th percentile of the national income distribution. So all of these kids are starting out in low-income families. We classify them in this map into 740 different metro and rural areas based on where they grew up, importantly where they grew up, not necessarily where they live now as adults. Uh, and in each of those 740 areas, we compute the average incomes of kids who grew up in low-income families uh, there. The map is colored so that blue colors represent areas with higher levels of upward mobility, and red colors represent areas with lower levels of upward mobility. So start by looking at the scale in the lower right. You can see that there's a tremendous amount of variation in kids' chances of rising up in the United States. In the darkest blue colors, for instance, in the center of the country, much of the Great Plains, for example, places like Iowa, um, you see that kids who grow up in families with household incomes of $25,000 a year have average household incomes above $46,000 a year. So they've moved up tremendously in one generation on average. In contrast, if you look at places in the southeast, the industrial Midwest, places like Cleveland, places like Charlotte, for example, 
you see average incomes of 26,000, relatively little progress across generations. In fact, mo many kids are gonna be earning less than their parents in those areas. So you can see for yourself, you know, the, the broad uh, regional variation in this map. Uh, the, the main point I wanna make here is that, uh, that the chart that I started out with of the fading American dream is extremely heterogeneous across different parts of the country. So naturally with this, you know, when you see a map like this, the, the question of interest to us as academics, the question of interest to practitioners is what's going on here? What's driving that variation? What might we be able to do to increase upward mobility in places that currently offer kids poorer chances in the United States? So I'm gonna basically go through a series of answers, potential answers and potential policy solutions in this talk. Starting with what I think is the first explanation many people think of when I show them this map, which is, is this about differences in the economies in different places? Is this about differences in the labor markets, job growth, the vitality of the local economy? So let me give you one example. You take a place like Charlotte. Charlotte, many of you might know, uh, is one of the fastest growing economies in the US by any traditional indicator of economic success, job growth, wage growth, average incomes, things like that. Charlotte would be near the top of the list in terms of being a booming economy. We're doing some work in Charlotte. We're just driving around there a couple weeks ago. If you're driving around Charlotte, you think, wow, this place is really booming. It's obvious. Yet, as you can see from this map, Charlotte is one of the places in America with the lowest levels of upward mobility for kids who grow up there. So that right there, that one observation, immediately suggests that this is not just about job growth. And in fact, you can see that more clearly uh, if we look at data now for the 30 largest metro areas where we're just doing a simple scatter plot of upward mobility on the vertical axis, the data from the map that I just showed you, against rates of job growth over the past 20 years or so. And what you can see is that this basically looks like there's no relationship, right? So in particular, you have places like Charlotte and Atlanta in the lower right, which have incredibly high rates of job growth, but the kids who grow up there don't really seem to benefit from that. So how does that happen? How does it add up? The way it works is that Charlotte and Atlanta effectively import talent. Lots of people move to Charlotte and Atlanta to get those high paying jobs, but somehow the kids who grow up in those areas don't really benefit from, from that growth. So I think that's an important result because it shows you that while obviously at some level jobs are important for mobility, people have to have ways to earn higher incomes, at a local level, the solution is not obviously greater job growth. You know, if you think about this from a concrete perspective, bringing Amazon to your city is not necessarily gonna create greater opportunities for upward mobility for the people there, right? That's like basically what you see uh, from this chart. Okay, so that's point number one. There's a difference between upward mobility and human capital development and traditional indicators of economic growth. Okay, so now coming back to, to the map, let's consider another possibility. Um, anyone familiar with demographic patterns in the United States would immediately recognize that there seems to be some correlation between these patterns and racial demographics. In particular, places with larger African-American populations like the Southeast, like places like Cleveland or Detroit or Milwaukee, tend to be the places with lower levels of upward mobility. So natural second hypothesis, is this really about place or is it about race? Is it that black Americans have different chances of climbing the income ladder than white Americans and that's being manifested in the map uh, that we see here? So we can analyze that question by drawing on data from a study we put out uh, last year where we're basically able to construct the map separately by race. So on the left here, we're showing the data for black men. On the right, we're showing the exact same map for white men. So let me make a few points about this, this uh, chart. So first, when you look at these two maps, you probably think intuitively, oh, they put these two maps on two different scales, right? They look like they're two completely different sets of colors. In fact, we have not. They're on the same scale, as you can see on the bottom. It's just that the very lowest places in upward, terms of upward mobility for white men actually have higher levels of upward mobility than the very best places for black men. That's the extent of racial disparities in America in terms of upward mobility. It's basically the, like they're two different countries completely non-overlapping in terms of kids' chances of rising up, okay? So you can see very clear, clearly here, race is in fact incredibly important in driving some of these differences. Second though, you can see that even within race, uh, if you look at the chart for whites, 
there's still quite a bit of variation even among white folks, right? Your, your average incomes are going from something like 24, 23,000 all the way up to 35 or in places like Newark, $48,000 a year. So race matters, but place also matters. Furthermore, what you can see is when you see the very low rates of upward mobility in the Southeast, you know, intuitively a lot of people have, have the sense that, you know, maybe that's driven by poorer opportunities for black Americans growing up in the Southeast. But in fact, what you can see is that it's the white Americans growing up in the Southeast, in particular in Appalachia, who have the lowest rates of upward mobility. The, the, the deep South, you know, places like Louisiana and so forth, actually look slightly better for blacks than other parts of the country, okay? So, uh, you know, what this shows you is, the, the picture here is nuanced. You don't want to just think about this all as being about place. You know, other factors like race matters as well. So now, when thinking about race, uh, I'm fo gonna focus in most of this talk and most of this conference is gonna focus on people starting out at low levels of income and climbing up. But I think especially in the context of race, it's also important to think about the opposite phenomenon of downward mobility. People who have made it out of poverty, are they able to stay out of poverty? And so to show you why that's so important, I'm gonna turn to this chart here, uh, which illustrates patterns of downward mobility for black versus white men raised in high income families. Okay, so how the, the way this is constructed is we're gonna follow the lives of black and white men who grew up in families in the top fifth of the income distribution, okay? Looking at the other end of the income spectrum. And we're gonna ask at a national level, where do these men themselves end up in adulthood across the five quintiles of the income distribution? The bottom fifth, the second fifth, all the way up to the top fifth. Purple dots are for black men, Green dots are for white men. So what you can see is that the green dots kind of float along the top. If you grow up in an affluent family as a white man, you tend to remain in the top fifth or in the second top fifth. You're certainly in the upper middle class for the most part. If you look in contrast at the purple dots, you see something really disheartening. Even if you start out in the top fifth, you've made it out of poverty in the previous generation. You have an incredibly high chance of coming back down to the bottom fifth or ending up in the second fifth, right? So this phenomenon is extremely important because this is what leads, I think, to the perpetuation of racial disparities across generations. Even if you have mobility out of poverty, if you don't fix this, you'll constantly have people coming back into poverty, right? The way I think about it visually is if you think about achieving the American dream as climbing an income ladder for white Americans, it's more like being on a treadmill for, for black Americans, right? And unless you fix the treadmill, you're never fundamentally gonna change the rate of poverty for black Americans. So in our group, we focus, in light of this kind of evidence, not just on mobility out of poverty, particularly in the context of race, but we're quite focused on trying to understand how you produce better outcomes for black men uh, who are starting out in the middle class or even the upper middle class. How do you preserve better opportunities for them? Now, notice in all of this, I've been focusing specifically on black versus white men as opposed to women. It turns out if you do the same kind of analysis for women, you don't find much of a difference at all in the outcomes of black versus white women, conditional on parental income. It's completely driven by differences, black versus white men. So it's again, you know, an important thing to keep in mind as we think about potential solutions, think about factors like criminal justice, incarceration, that might play a particular role for men. All right, so what I wanna do next is we've talked about kind of two broad factors, job growth, race, at kind of a national level. I now wanna zoom in to the data and look at the data at a very local level within New York. And so before I show you the data here, we wanna do, you know, get the audience involved a bit and see what you all think the patterns might be. So very simple question, in which neighborhood is the rate of upward mobility out of poverty highest in New York City? If you take out your phone or your laptop, Go to this website, pollevy.com slash rc011. You'll be able to drop a pin wherever you think uh, mobility is highest in, in New York City. You know, just drop it in whatever neighborhood, uh, you know, within the borough or pick a borough where, where you think uh, mobility is highest. And I'm interested to see what people's perceptions are and how they compare to the actual data, which I'll show you in a second. So let me give you a minute to do that. <laughs> 
sure why it's not working. Has it stalled? Do you know why it's stalled? It's okay, not sure why it's full with the. Uh, Huh. All right, it should be able to handle more than that many, but with a relatively <laughs> small sample. Uh, all right, it, it seems to have some technical difficulties, but my, uh, great. Uh, so my general sense here is that uh, people seem to think Queens has particularly high rates of upward mobility, some support for Brooklyn, not much for the Bronx. Staten Island, Manhattan, it's actually relatively diffused, right, in terms of people's perceptions. Okay, great, so now sh uh, if we can flip over to this laptop, please. Um, okay, so what we're gonna do now is we're zooming in to New York City using a tool that called the Opportunity Atlas, which we released um, a couple of months ago. And just give it a minute to load with the internet here uh, so that we can show you the data in New York City. Um, and it's still loading, one sec. And so we'll be able to look at the data now. What I was showing you initially at the national level, we'll be able to look at it census tract by census tract for all of New York City, okay? So what we're doing here um, is exact same statistic we started out with. You start out in a low-income family. Where do you end up on average in adulthood? First thing I want to note is it's the same color scheme as before, right? Blue is high rates of upward mobility, red is low rates of upward mobility. Notice that the spectrum of colors that you see in this map is exactly the same spectrum as what you saw at a national level, right? So in other words, you can go from one part of New York City to another, often just you know a couple of miles, and it's like you're going from Alabama to Iowa in terms of rates of upward mobility. So the first thing that shows you is this is an incredibly local phenomenon. When you look at the national map, you might have thought, oh, this is about differences in the Midwest and the Southeast. No, it's actually about differences you know, just down the street relative to where we are right now. Uh, the second thing in response you know, to the, the question we asked, what are the areas of New York that have the highest rates of upward mobility? Turns out um, that especially if you think about you know, where low-income people um, tend to live in the city, where it would be affordable to live as a, as a lower-income uh, American. So if you look down here in Brooklyn, uh, you know, parts of Queens, you do see some of the highest rates of upward mobility. In Harlem uh, and parts of Manhattan up here in the Bronx, you see lower rates of upward mobility. Now, one thing I should note as an important caveat, uh, especially with Jeff Kanda here in the audience, is that this data is for kids born in the 1980s whose incomes we're measuring at age 30 today, right? So by its nature, when you're looking at upward mobility, it has to be historical. Uh, and so interventions like the Harlem Children's Zone, which hopefully have changed that picture substantially, are not necessarily going to be picked up uh, in, in the information that we're, that we're showing you here. But by and large, you know, that's an exceptional case where a place has been transformed quite dramatically. Mostly in the U.S., we tend to find that these patterns are pretty stable over time. Okay, so you, know, you can see the, the variation for yourself here, here in New York City. I want to make a couple of points which are, uh, which are useful to note. So first, here we're pooling races. So part of the differences that we're seeing here, because I showed you that black Americans have lower chances of climbing up than white Americans, uh, part of the differences are driven by uh, just differences in where blacks versus whites are living within the city. So what we can do with this tool is look at the data by race. So if I click on white, um, if I click on white, you see you know, much of the map will disappear because there aren't enough white uh, Americans in, in some of these places to compute uh, upward mobility. Uh, and I'm going to change the way we do the colors here. And so you can see that even for whites, there's quite a bit of variation in rates of upward mobility across, say, the Bronx versus uh, Manhattan uh, versus Queens, et cetera. So it's not just about race. Again, you're seeing quite a bit of variation you know, within race. Conversely, if we go to, to blacks, uh, we see in different parts of the city, and sorry, the internet's a bit slow, um, you know, you, you again see quite a bit of variation uh, where it's different parts of the Bronx that look better, where blacks are more concentrated. But again, you see sharp variation, you know, between this part of the city down here in the Bronx versus in Harlem, quite substantial differences in outcomes. Now, one group for which you see really uh, distinct 
patterns uh, is Hispanics. So if we compare um, Hispanic Americans to Americans in, uh, to Hispanics in the rest of the country, one pattern that's a bit striking and unusual about New York City is that in general, Hispanics have rates of upward and downward mobility that are not that different from whites. But it turns out that when you look at New York in particular, the Hispanic population has some of the highest rates of downward mobility and very low rates of upward mobility. So that's something I think worth digging into further here in New York for those focused on poverty issues here. We see something quite distinct in the Opportunity Atlas data specifically for Hispanics within New York City. Okay, so I've been showing you these patterns at a relatively broad level, even within New York, looking across boroughs, looking across different neighborhoods. I wanna now zoom in to one, you know, a very local level by entering, you can enter any address you want if you go to this website, opportunityatlas.org, um, and I'm gonna go to a place called 530 Sutter Avenue in Brooklyn, which is uh, an area called Brownsville. Um, let me see if I can pull this up here. Okay, and so what I'm gonna do is zoom into this particular area in Brooklyn, um, 530 Sutter Avenue. And let's see if we can get this. Right, so, okay, so this uh, place that I've selected is a place called the Van Dyke Housing Projects in Brownsville. Some of you might know Brownsville, it's known as an area of high poverty, high crime, you know, tough conditions. Uh, and co corresponding to that, you see, you know, dark red colors here in Brownsville in particular in this housing project. Uh, average household incomes of just $18,000 for black kids who grow up there. Another statistic which you can see by looking at these data, we have in data not just on incomes but on things like incarceration rates. Turns out that 33% of the black men who grow up in this tract are incarcerated on a single day the date of the 2010 census. So really adverse outcomes, right, in this particular tract. But now, interestingly, if you just look on the other side of the street, Dumont Avenue, in general, if you just look on this side of the street instead of this side of the street, you see quite different outcomes, right, with substantially higher incomes, you know, average incomes of something like $28,000, $29,000 a year instead of $17,000, $18,000 a year on this side of the street. So you see extremely local variation uh, across narrow areas. And so what I wanna do now is if we can go back to the slides, um, I wanna dig into why that's the case. We've started out at this very broad national level, zoomed into New York, zoomed into this one specific place. And I wanna now bring in the human element and talk about the people who are living in these areas, and in particular, turn to a story, a very nice story done by NPR about a woman who grew up in the Brownsville area that tells you a little bit about what's going on here. When people find out where Audra Palacio is from, they often react in disbelief. Well, how, how could you come from there and you live there? And it's like, almost as if it's like, I can't believe you made it out. Nearly 40% of Brownsville lives in poverty. And if you look at the Opportunity Atlas and zoom into Brownsville, a lot of it is exactly what you'd expect. Black kids raised in the area 30 some years ago now make about $17,000 a year. Same as their parents. But once you head across Dumont Avenue, everything changes. Black kids from the same exact background are doing better than their parents, making around $26,000 a year. So what's going on, to just summarize the story that I just told you, what's going on in the difference between those, those places? Turns out there's a, there's a nice story here. Let's continue. In the 80s, New York City had been hard hit by a recession. Then the crack and HIV epidemics. There was a part of Brownsville that was totally abandoned, the other side of Dumont. The New York City government sold over 16 square blocks of Brownsville to the East Brooklyn congregations for one dollar. Those blocks were dilapidated, run down, the city agreed to build infrastructure and provide cash subsidies for over a thousand affordable homes. They would start selling at $30,000 each. They were called Nehemiah houses, after the man in the Bible who rebuilt parts of Jerusalem. The family was growing and we needed something that was much better for the children. 
I didn't like elevators, up and down the elevators for my children because it was a lot of people living in the housing projects. Audra Palacio was six when they bought the house. I remember when we moved into the Nehemiahs. We were so excited. We had rooms, we had space, we had our backyard. Here's Reverend Brawley. He says the Nehemiah houses in Brooklyn gave children a space to do homework, a good night's sleep. When people have ownership of their properties, ownership of their community, you have a better chance of addressing all core issues, such as education and quality of life. After I leave the family, I walk just a few blocks to Dumont Avenue. According to the Atlas, it's the dividing line. On the map, it looks jarring, but in person, it's completely unspectacular. People bustle on their way to work, cars zoom by. Just another New York City street. It means nothing. But what side you're on means everything. Jasmine Garz, NPR News, New York. And so what you can see there is that the problem we started out with, which at some level seems incredibly daunting at a national level of the fading American dream, is actually originating at an extremely local level in people's lives on two different sides of a street. And so I think that's hopefully both, you know, it makes the problem more complicated to solve, but hopefully it's also encouraging in the sense that it's precisely the people in this room who can make a difference at that scale, I think, in in addressing this issue. And so what I want to turn to then in the, in the remainder of this talk is exactly that question about what can we do in light of this sort of evidence to try to increase economic opportunity for Americans. And so I think the very granular place level origins of the issue point to two different directions. The first you can think of as a moving to opportunity approach, providing more affordable housing basically in the high opportunity areas. So the appeal of this approach is that in some level it's very intuitive. If I know that there are certain neighborhoods in New York that produce better outcomes for kids, what if I just try to get more low-income families to those neighborhoods? There's a simplicity to that because I don't need to understand exactly what is leading to better outcomes in some place than others. Moreover, we already spend about $45 billion a year in the U.S. on various affordable housing programs, so maybe we can use those to better achieve mobility out of poverty. So I'll talk a bit about that. But of course, we have to recognize that moving to opportunity is not a scalable approach. You can't possibly move everyone out of you know, the Bronx to a different part of New York, et cetera, and it's not even clear you'd have the same impacts if you were to try to do that. And so ultimately, the, the key solution is the type of approach that uh, Jeff has taken in the Harlem Children's Zone, others are trying to pursue, place-based investments increasing upward mobility in lower opportunity areas. So I'll talk about each of these in turn for a few minutes. So let's start with the moving to opportunity approach. I'm gonna give you an example from Seattle where we're doing some work with the local housing authority in a pilot program at present to try to uh, pursue this approach. So this is the Opportunity Atlas map for Seattle. Like in other cities, you see substantial variation in outcomes across places. In particular, focus on two places, the central district, the center of the city versus Normandy Park. You see dramatic differences in kids' outcomes in adulthood, about a $20,000 difference in earnings for kids starting out in low-income families. Now, the, what I wanna talk about is the simple idea of trying to help families move from a place like the Central District to a place like Normandy Park with their housing vouchers. So the first question you might ask is, do we have any evidence that this would actually work? Like, is it clear that making such a move will actually improve kids' outcomes? And the answer to that is yes, and I wanna illustrate the way we reach that conclusion by giving you the, uh, an example from a study we've done where we analyze millions of families that move across neighborhoods and look at how their kids' outcomes change in adulthood. So specifically, think about a set of families that move from the Central District to Normandy Park with kids of different ages, starting with families who move when their child is exactly two years old. So what we're doing here is tracking this child who made that move when he or she was two, forward 30 years, and measuring their earnings in adulthood. And what we see in that first dot is that kids who move when they're two from the Central District to Normandy Park earn on average about $39,000 a year in adulthood. So that's for the kids who move when they're exactly two. Let's repeat that analysis now for kids who move when they're three, four, five, and so on. What you see is a very clear declining pattern. The later you make that move, the less of a gain you get, 
And if you move after you're in your early 20s uh, or in early adulthood, the relationship becomes completely flat and you get essentially no gain. So what you see from this chart is that moving to opportunity does in fact seem to work. If you move, particularly as a young child, to a bluer colored area on the map, to a higher opportunity area on the map, you do in fact have substantially better outcomes in adulthood. And I'm focusing on earnings here, but the same holds in terms of lower incarceration rates, lower teenage birth rates, you know, a variety of outcomes. You see substantial improvements when kids move at, at younger ages. So that shows you that, you know, there's some proof in practice that this kind of approach can actually work. There's a larger and larger body of evidence showing um, that, that moving to opportunity can make a difference. Now, why is that particularly interesting from a policy point of view? If you look at the data on where families with housing vouchers currently live um, in, in Seattle, shown by the dots here, these are the most common locations where families with housing vouchers live, you see that they tend to be concentrated in the red and orange colored parts of the map, right? So even though they're getting this rental assistance from the government, they are not, in fact, using that to live in high opportunity areas. Now, you might think that's because the higher opportunity places would be completely unaffordable. But that actually turns out not to be the case. The example I was giving you of Normandy Park, turns out rents in Normandy Park are actually lower than the rents in many of the places where families with housing vouchers are currently living. In that sense, Normandy Park is sort of an opportunity bargain. It's an affordable place that provides good opportunities for low-income kids. And so motivated by that evidence and using the Opportunity Atlas data, we are now running a pilot study in collaboration with the Seattle Housing Authority <coughs> where we're helping families with housing vouchers move to high opportunity areas using three approaches, providing information, recruiting landlords to participate in this program, and offering housing search assistance. This pilot has been in the field for about the past nine months or so, and I'm not able to present the results here because we're not yet going public with them, but let me just say, you know, kind of off the record, this thing is incredibly successful. I've never seen something in social science that has such a big impact in terms of helping families move to, to higher opportunity areas, and so we're hoping this will be scalable going forward. Um, and importantly, it's at very low incremental cost to taxpayers. So relative to the amount of money that HUD is already spending, this would be like a 1% change or something on the margin in terms of expenditures and would tremendously increase the impact of the program in terms of helping families move to opportunity. So that's you know, one concrete path forward. In the last few minutes, I want to talk about the second approach, place-based investments, uh, where we want to figure out how to improve the kind of the red-colored places on the map. Okay, so the first step to doing that is you want to, you know, basically the goal here from an academic point of view is to try to figure out what is the recipe that produces better outcomes in some parts of the country than others. And so I'm going to start with this here, which is, you know, the simplest way you might think about it. What are the characteristics of places that have higher levels of upward mobility? And so what you can see is you know, we've looked at a variety of different predictive factors. I'm summarizing here the four strongest predictors. Places with high levels of upward mobility tend to have lower poverty rates, more stable family structures, that is more two-parent families, greater social capital, so more connections across groups of, of different types, and better school quality. Okay, so that does not, you know, by itself tell you the recipe. It does not exactly tell you what interventions you need to pursue in order to improve outcomes. But it gives you a sense that, you know, there are a variety of different things that matter. As I was saying earlier, it's not just about schools. It's not just about, you know, resources. It's about a, a combination of different things. And so to give you a sense, uh, to, to wrap up, of where we are headed in trying to figure out what that recipe is and what we think the path forward might be, I want to talk about some work that we're doing in Charlotte, where, as I was mentioning at the beginning, Charlotte turns out is 50th out of the 50, 50 largest cities in America in terms of rates of upward mobility. That was a statistic we put out about four or five years ago in our, one of our first papers on this issue. And in response to that, Charlotte set up a commission and a task force to figure out how to improve upward mobility in their city. You know, they asked, how can we be such a, a rich city, a growing city, yet be ranked dead last in terms of rates of upward mobility. And that, I think, was incredibly constructive. We have now teamed up with Charlotte, now that we have this granular data within Charlotte, to try to work with them, work with city agencies, local nonprofits, and so forth, on basically trying to figure out how to revitalize 
lower opportunity neighborhoods in Charlotte. And what I want to do uh, to end is just give you a feel for how we are going about uh, that process. Not because we have the answers, we certainly don't. We don't know exactly what works, but this will give you a sense of how we're trying to figure it out and hopefully you know, uh, provide pathways that you might choose to pursue in your own work. We'd be eager to talk about more. So the way we're structuring things in Charlotte is through sort of a life course perspective, where if you think about you know, from early childhood education to college and career re uh, readiness, you know, there are various points of intervention if you think about the pipeline to opportunity that you want to try to support for kids. Now, in each of these areas, let's take an example of affordable housing and segregation, which I think matters throughout the life course. We're trying to bring our data to bear to try to help the city make better de decisions. So here's an example. We've overlaid um, the places where affordable housing developments using the low-income housing tax credit are currently placed in Charlotte. Similar to what I showed you in Seattle, you can see that they're concentrated in the very low opportunity areas. So I think unintentionally, these programs that try to support affordable housing are actually perpetuating poverty across generations to some extent by concentrating in low opportunity areas rather than doing the reverse. So we are working with the city of Charlotte as they expand affordable housing. They have a $50 million bond to expand affordable housing. We're trying to figure out ways that they might be able to get some of that housing built in higher opportunity places. Now, this issue is not just unique to Charlotte. If you do the same kind of map in New York, you see exactly the same issue in New York. This is prevalent across many cities in America. A second related issue is that in a lot of places where you do place-based development, I was just talking to Jeff about this the other day in, in Harlem, when you're very successful in revitalizing a community, often you face the challenge that it gentrifies and falls out of reach of the low-income people you were trying to help to begin with. And so using these data, you can find the places that currently have high levels of upward mobility for low-income people, but are rapidly gentrifying, and try to kind of get ahead of that problem and preserve affordable housing before you lose a grip, another thing we're working on with Charlotte. Okay, so in a, in a different dimension, um, turning to the higher education space, uh, in that context, you can think about how mobility varies across colleges in the Charlotte area, and here we're showing that more broadly around the United States as well. So what we're doing here is plotting upward mobility rates for kids who attend each college in America, what fraction of kids start out in low-income families and end up reaching the top fifth, against low-income access, what fraction of your student body is from the bottom fifth. So if you take a place like Harvard, for example, has great outcomes for low-income kids, the problem is there are hardly any low-income kids at Harvard. So Harvard is not a place that generates a lot of mobility. You can't generate a lot of mobility if you don't have any low-income kids, right? Um, in contrast, if you look at UNCC in Charlotte, it has better access and relatively good outcomes. Or you take a place like Central Piedmont Community College, it has even more low-income kids, but relatively poor outcomes. And so by using that granular college-specific data that we've constructed, we are working with local institutions to try to improve access at UNCC and improve outcomes by emulating various successful programs around the country at CPCC, channeling that back to different neighborhoods in which kids grew up. Okay, and then finally, um, in the context of social capital, you know, we're working with a variety of groups in Charlotte, uh, again, using a data-driven approach to try to understand you know, which programs in the YMCA or the communities and schools program seem to be working. How can we bring them all to bear in neighborhoods where social capital seems to be lacking? So uh, I want to end by, you know, that gives you a sense of how we're trying to do things on the ground. We don't yet know exactly what the recipe is for success. The path forward from an academic evidence-based perspective uh, is, I think, to use historical data to study which place-based policies are, in fact, incredibly effective. So what we're calling the American Opportunity Study, where there are about a dozen sociologists and economists teaming up to analyze upward mobility starting in 1950 by digitizing data from tapes held at the Census Bureau. This is an incredibly complicated, expensive project that we're just trying to get underway. The idea is that we can use these data to study the impacts of place-based interventions on the people who were living in a place before you tried to do that intervention. So often you see that when you try to improve a place, average incomes go up, everything looks better, 
but you have no idea if that's just because you displaced the low-income people who lived there before and you displaced gentrified, or did you actually help the people who were there? We basically don't know. With these types of data, we will be able to answer that question. In my view, that's really the path to understanding what place-based approaches can work going forward. So let me end by uh, just saying that uh, we're all greatly inspired by the great work you're, you're doing on the ground. And at Opportunity Insights, we hope to be able to support that work going forward by providing an evidence base. Uh, and we'd be delighted to work with you. A number of our team members are here. We look forward to the conversation. Thanks so much. So I'm not sure if we're out of time or supposed to take questions. You can tell me what I'm supposed to do. Okay, happy to take questions. But call them out here. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, I, so I'm Ben Thomas. I'm the executive director of Queens Community House. We're an organization that really tries to fight poverty by building social capital. Yeah, great. And I'd just love to hear you talk more about what constitutes social capital. You kind of finished pretty quickly yeah. on that in the end. And in the study you published, you talk about rate of return of census forms, which is sort yeah. of not intuitive to me yeah. as a measure of social capital. Yeah. So if, if we're an organization, if we're trying to build social capital in very poor public housing yeah. developments and other low-income neighborhoods, what would you say are some of the things that are sort of evidence-based measures of social capital that we could yeah. focus on? Thanks for that question. I mean, that's a, it's a great question, obviously. You know, this term social capital, people love to talk about it, but it's kind of nebulous. What exactly does it mean? And so let me give you our best stab. You know, measures like the census response rate, Bob Putnam uses bowling alone. Obviously, these are rough proxies for the underlying thing we're trying to measure. What we're doing right now is using social network data to measure who's connected to whom. Are low-income people connected to high-income people? Are people of different backgrounds connected to each other? And my sense is that's one key element of what it's about. And I think mentoring and you know, aspirations, who you're connected to, is at least one tangible. I'm not saying that's the only thing that's relevant in social capital, but I think it's a core part of it. And the reason I say that is we have, and others have compiled evidence, that who you're connected to, in particular who you're influenced by, has a great influence on, a uh, great impact on what kids end up doing. So to give you one example, if you grow up of, around people of the same race and uh, same sort of background who pursue a specific career, uh, in particular, we show this in the context of innovation. If you grow up around inventors from your background, you are much more likely to become an inventor yourself. And the mechanism is very specific. If girls grow up around more female inventors in a specific field, they are more likely to pursue innovation, but not if they grow up around male inventors in that same field, right? And so what that suggests is part of the mechanisms here, it's, it's not just broad brush stuff like the quality of schools and kind of bigger programs but specifically who you're connected to. Um, and so we are trying to put out, we hope, we hope you know, in the next six months to a year, we'll be able to put out much more precise measures of social capital and connectedness by area that will help us be more precise and perhaps help organizations like yours measure impact. There are lots of questions, and uh, we'll oh, pick at random. Yes? I have a question about the implications on density. Yeah. You know, the, the example you used with the Audra Palacios and, you know, the, the experience of yeah. Dumont Avenue, there's a lot of allusions to density, right? We didn't want to have a place with elevators. Yep. We had a backyard, yep. definitive place to own. Yep. So that's a recipe for low density in a city yeah. like New York where I don't think that's really going to work if we're talking yeah. about affordable housing. So yeah. I just wanted to know how you're thinking about density and how yeah. it impacts what you're yeah. looking at. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, you know, you see that denser places, as you picked on housing projects, most extreme version of that. Extremely concentrated, dense poverty tends to be associated with worse outcomes. That's just a fact in the data. Um, now, it's not, if you st zoom out a little bit and you ask kind of are urban areas worse in terms of upward mobility than rural areas? The answer to that actually turns out to vary quite a bit across settings. So you could see in the big map at the beginning that the rural Midwest looked better than the dense urban centers. Turns out in the Southeast, that pattern's actually flipped the cities actually look a better, little better than the surrounding rural areas. So even you know, when we correlate with population density, you actually find different signs in different parts of the country. So a lot of what comes out of these data is that while it's tempting to kind of look for single answers to questions like that, the answer itself is often very heterogeneous across places. And so what I'd encourage people to do is 
if you are studying a specific context, want to improve out opportunity in a specific place, just look at the data for that place and it may turn out to be the case that as in that Brownsville example, the very dense housing projects were the places with the worst outcomes. In other places, it may turn out to be a, a different picture and I think that's the value of actually having the data. Yeah. Okay, and I'm happy to talk with people afterward. Yeah. And I'm curious to know if you've also looked at the impact of incarceration on families and on children's trajectories. Yeah. Yeah, so that is a very important and interesting question. Of course, we ourselves have not. There has been some other work done by Adam Looney and other scholars uh, looking at these issues. And I don't think we have a definitive answer to your question yet. But one sense I get from that work is that when you look at people who get incarcerated, their outcomes look quite poor even before they're incarcerated, unfortunately, right? And so if you were to just ask, do I see things going totally off the rails after you get incarcerated relative to before, the answer to that is actually, you know, if I were to graph your earnings around the point of incarceration or employment rates, I don't actually see a huge change because you weren't on a great trajectory to begin with. So that's not, you know, the way I interpret that is not incarceration doesn't matter, of course it matters, but rather we need to think about what in the pipeline is leading people down the path of getting incarcerated to begin with just as much as trying to tackle issues in the criminal justice system itself. Okay, so again, sorry we ran out of time, but I'll be around and our team members around. We're very happy to talk more. Thank you.